How's it going YouTube? It's almost Christmas. I hope you're ready. And while I know it's not the time of year when Jesus was probably born, it is the time of year when we celebrate the greatest gift given to mankind. The true reason for the season when God sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to be our uh, way, to be our redeemer, to be our salvation. So I hope you remember that in this Christmas time and that you have a great Christmas. This week, the title is kind of a question. It's is our happiness fundamentally important to being a good Christian? And you know, it's kind of a tricky question because so many times Satan will twist us just a little bit and make it seem right, but lead us to destruction. So is our happiness fundamentally important? Do we have to be happy to be a good Christian, right? I'm not saying should we be sad in order to be a good Christian? Or do we have to be sad? Or do we have to be miserable to be a good Christian? I'm not saying that. Because I don't think that's the case either. But so many people I've heard preacher stand on a podium and take Jesus' own word where he was asked, what are the most important commandments? And he said, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And he said, you know what? If you hate yourself, you can't love God. If you hate yourself, you can't love others. So what God really means is you got to love yourself. You got to put yourself first. Basically is what he said. He rearranged it. He said, if you want to do what God commands, you have to love yourself so you can love God and love others. It, put, it rearranged it from God, others, yourself to yourself, others, and God. Right? And that's what he did. Ain't that what Satan does? He takes God's words and he twists it just a little bit to make it seem right. Ain't that what he did in the Garden of Eden? When he said, will you surely die? No, no, you'll be like God. Won't you have a better relationship with God if you're like him? Right? That's what, ain't that the most important thing? And we do the same thing with this, right? We take and we want to put ourselves first so we can love God and love others and make it seem right to be selfish. See, many times when we put ourselves first, or most of the time when we put ourselves first, it leads to compromise. It rearranges our priorities, right? And an example, right? Say you're married, but it ain't new. It ain't uh, whatever. Maybe it's bad sometimes. Maybe there's arguing. Maybe you're miserable sometimes. But there's this other person over here that's new, that's giving you attention, and you say, well, I, I'm having the hardest time loving God and loving others because I'm miserable in my marriage. So you know what? If I get divorced and go be with this other person, then I'll love God, and then I'll love others better. And look at how, how that will work. That's, how, that's what God really wants, right? That's what he commands me to do, right? So it's right that I do this. We compromised. Because we, we make it seem right. We make it seem like the right thing to do. But that's not the truth. You see, putting yourself first, having that compromise in your life, being selfish is like taking your sack lunch to a pit of alligators every day and throwing it in. It's never enough. Our own selfishness, our own attempt at attaining happiness on our own, it's never enough. It's never filling. It's never... Anything that fills us up to where we can then love God and love others. All we do is seek our own happiness. It's fleeting from us, though. You see? And let's read what God said, what Jesus said. In Mark 8, 34 through 36, we're only going to read the first two verses to start with. It says, When he had called the people to himself, with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. He says, if you're desiring to make yourself happy so you can love God and love others, you're going to lose, right? You're going to lose. But if you deny yourself and follow me, even if you lose your life, you will gain it, right? Even if you lose your life, you'll gain it. See, what people get torn on this part about, is it fundamentally important to be happy to be a good Christian? Is happiness fundamentally important? 
is the fact that the Bible tells us if we follow God, we're going to be happy. We'll find true joy, right? And many say, well, I've done that. I've, I've gone to church. I've done, you know, what he asked, and I was just miserable. I got stepped on and everything else. Did you do it to gain something of yourself? Did you do it for your own happiness? Or did you do it unconditionally? As God did. See, God gave us the example first. He sent his own son unconditionally. Well, it says while we were still enemies of him, he died for us. Unconditionally. He didn't do it to gain anything of his own. Right? So what is your motive behind what you do? Is it because it's, you know, what we think we have to do to attain happiness? Or is it because it's what we want to do because we love God? That's the difference, right? That will give you the difference. See, Jesus says, if you drink from my waters, you'll never thirst again. He wants to be the source of your joy. If we try to be the source of our joy, we fail. If we, other, we try to make others the source of our joy, we fail. But if we go to God and put our faith and trust in him and follow him, he will be the source of our joy. And yes, we will be happy. So we can't twist this. We can't say ourselves that others than God. It doesn't work. We, we might gain the whole world. In fact, in verse 36, Jesus said, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? If we take and seek our own happiness and we gain the whole world, but we lose our soul, what good was it? Did you ever love God in that? Or was it all about seeking your own, seeking your own happiness that was never attained? And now eternity's lost. See, my prayer for not only myself, but others, my family, or, you know, anybody who hears this word is that God would break you. And that, you know, you might say, man, that's harsh. I don't wanna be broken. But so many times when we compromise, we can't see the truth. So I pray that God breaks you so we are left with a choice of the truth or to continue to follow the lie. That we might choose the truth. That we might choose God. You say it might seem harsh that God would break me in order to do that. But you know what? It's because he loves you. Because he wants eternity for you. Eternity with him, not separated from him. That's what God did when he sent his son before, while we were still enemies of him. When he died for us, while we still hated him, while we were still against him. He did it because he wanted to spend eternity with us. But you know what? He's not going to force you to spend eternity with him. That's your choice. What will you choose? What will you choose? I pray that you put your trust in him to be your joy, to be your salvation. Have a great Christmas. Remember the true reason for the season. And I got a good one for you next week, man. God's been working on my heart for this one. I got a good one. So I hope you tune in. I hope you're just blessed, but not by me, by him, by the one who saves, because I'm nothing. I'm not a good speaker. I'm not a good person, really, when it comes down to it. The only thing I can say is that his righteousness has covered me and made me righteous, and that's it. Not nothing I've done. That his blood has cleansed my sins, right? I hope the same is for you. So have a great week. I'll speak to you maybe even sooner. Maybe I'll do a couple videos. I don't know. I'm going to try. But we'll see how it goes, right? Have a great week. Have a great Christmas. Follow God.